Um, thanks for inviting me to come talk. Really appreciate it. Yeah, like Alex said, um, you know, my, I uh, have a PhD, um, at one of the CMU connections in neuroscience and computational neuroscience, a psychiatrist, and about uh, 20 years of experience doing uh, software development technology work. And so my work really is sort of this amalgam of those experiences. Um, and I work in a, um, in a center now that focuses on uh, um, health services and health disparities and community engagement and partnership with them um, to really address a lot of these barriers and, and challenges. So that also has been highlighted and infused, which we'll talk about a bit, to bring together this um, concept of participatory informatics, you know, doing a lot of what we're talking about today, but, but doing it in a way that, that takes the human uh, approach, a human aspect of things, front and center, and in a way that is co-created to help um, um, uh, address equity. And um, I would just want to say, Alec is a, f a good friend of mine, and uh, he mentioned that patients are uh, horrible at telling us uh, what's wrong, and, <laughs> and you wanted a lively discussion. So I'm just going to kick that off by completely disagreeing with that. And uh, my approach is the complete opposite, actually, of that, that uh, patients, it's all about them telling us what's wrong. <laughs> Um, but I also understand your point about surveys and patient reported outcomes and those are, are, are very kind of, they have a lot of limitations. So, um, so I, I agree and disagree too. All right. So we can discuss some disclosures. Tech companies I started, um, I'm talking about Chorus, a, a web application that helps people create their own apps in real time in a few minutes. Um, that's being licensed to a company that I started, not that we've really done anything with it yet outside of academia. Um, and the speech stuff, we recruited patients from a clinic that I have a family relationship with, so not that they own the IP for it, but um, important to discuss. So we talked about digital diagnosis, but, and we, we've talked about this throughout the day, but just to sort of think about, you know, we talk about diagnosis, like what, what literal diagnosis someone has, schizophrenia or not, or PTSD or not, but then, you know, there's domains of symptoms, and are we, are we trying to predict and track symptoms? I feel anxious or depressed. Of course, dimensional markers, RDOC, we had a great talk um, from the translational perspective at NIH um, around that. Um, but then, you know, the, the idea of personalized outcomes. So, yeah, I might be anxious, but what, what, um, what outcomes are important for me? And how do, how, do I, how do we learn that, know that about people, and take that into account? Um, and then this concept from the health services comp component about social determinants, which are an, a big issue in regular healthcare, non-digital aspects of things, but where we, where we grew up, where we live, and how that affects our health and um, mental health, uh, and can we, use, can we take advantage of that to inform these informatics and data analytic approaches, but also potentially help improve those social determinants, at least not make them worse. We talk about the digital divide, and I'll mention some things. So how do you, how do you get information that's relevant, but then use it respectfully to build equity? Um, so the approach... Um, you know, it's, it's hard, I want to talk just about the data part, but it's hard to separate the approach from it because it's such a big part of it. But really my approach with the Innovation Lab, oh sorry, I'm Director of the Innovation Lab at UCLA and um, looking for collaborations around that. So if any of this sort of sparks interest or, or, or anything related to your work, please come up to me during the poster session and, and let's, let's connect and collaborate. But the idea is, can we, can we use technologies to innovate around service delivery, solve practical problems today, um, but pair that with a lot of the things that we're talking about uh, during the summit to understand the human and biological aspects of wellness. Um, and the reason for, you know, pairing that implementation with the, the biological aspect is, you know, usually you go from idea to implementation, you know, it's like 10, 15 year process. And, you know, around digital health, you know, th things move fast, right? And uh, Google is always coming out with something verily, right? They're breathing down our necks. And, you know, the iPhone's only 10 years old, right? Imagine the state of, mental, state of technology before the iPhone, if you had created something before the iPhone, you know, now you do it, it could be potentially irrelevant. So um, that keeps me up at night. Um, uh, so, that, so the idea, you know, can we, um, can we go from idea, can we have a process of incubation potentially to get things out into implementation? Let's leverage the, the, health, the, the health systems that a lot of us represent or are connected with or come from at UCLA Health. We have large services delivery. So can we get these things out there to generate that kind of data in the real world, in the real life, and then shrink that gap from ideas to implementation to get things that are really used and helpful? And a lot of these points were made earlier today as well. 
So the one example, there's a lot of different ways we're doing that, but one example that I want to talk to you today is a, it's called, a project called My Coach Connect, and it's really looking at speech, using speech as a, a behavioral marker of wellness. Um, and, you know, uh, so thinking about the longitudinal perspective, like Justin was talking about earlier, you know, patients have uh, um, relapsing, remitting courses uh, with mental illness, and they have different uh, courses. So some people are do well, and they gradually decompensate and do better. And then some people do well, and then all of a sudden decompensate quickly. And other people are generally more stable. But we have these fixed office visit intervals, and you know, pretty bad at predicting when people need to be seen next. And are there ways to quantify this clinical course, um, pair it with what's going on with them, to try to identify these predictors of decompensation? And so, so, so a lot of my approaches are on speech. Um, and, you know, in short, words matter. Uh, and as a psychiatrist, obviously, uh, Freud um, uh, also, also felt that words mattered a lot. So if you chose a specific word, everyone was thinking, what word I'm going to pick? Because everyone was thinking, like, that word is going to mean something. Uh, they matter a lot. So we sit on the couch and we freely associate, you know, these specific words that we're saying, this, this, this Jedi knight, you know, uh, 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 of a psychoanalyst is sitting there and, and thinking about all these words and making meaning out of them. Uh, so I think intuitively, and also in the DSM, I mean, the way we talk and the paranoia and, and how we talk about being down, it's all clinically very intuitive. But also, you know, uh, um, from a cognitive perspective, so this is from the MOCA, it's a cognitive test, and they ask, a watch and a ruler are similar because they're both, what? Me measurements, right? So that means that whoever said that, your abstract thinking is intact, but if you were really sick or had dementia or, or schizophrenia, potentially, you might say something like, they both have numbers, which is correct, but not quite the right answer. So in a split second, your brain chose a word to use, and it chose measurements, but that's reflective of a very complex process going on in your mind. So potentially, the specific words we choose could be quite informative. And language encodes a very broad information space, too, so it's a great from an information coding perspective. So to test this out, um, you know, speech and computational aspects of speech have been investigated by a lot of people. James Pennebaker, for example, created the LIWC toolkit, and we use that toolkit to generate features, and, and a lot of people um, and, and others today are going to talk about the acoustic aspects of, of speech, of course, and I'm really looking forward to hearing about that. Um, but this is really looking at the lexical features, so specific words we choose, and the difference here is also um, a practical solution in a naturalistic clinical setting. So this is a, a community clinic in Compton, California. Patients with severe mental illness, transdiagnostic across diagnoses. And patients would call into this automated voice response system uh, one to two times per week and leave three to five minute free association voice samples. So literally it was, tell me how you've been over the last few days, try and talk for a few minutes, beep, and then they would talk and talk and talk and talk. And we, and we say like, for talk for at least two to three minutes and people could talk for 10 or 15 or more minutes. And we would transcribe, a poor like, research staff would transcribe these long uh, samples. And they would just keep calling, and we can talk a little bit more about why that was. But we got 47 individuals, over, uh, most of them over four months, but some up to 14 months, and about 1,000 calls uh, during this time. Here's an example of the provider portal. So the providers, and in this case, mostly case managers, life coaches, would um, have their patients, this is actual transcription of a patient, and they could see the, res they could read the responses and click and listen if they wanted or not to the, to, the, to the patient. The patient would rate themselves on a scale of one to 10, and then the provider would rate the patient on a scale of one to 10. And this is also part of one of the challenges is, what do you use as the gold standard? You know, we talk about machine learning, about the clinical state, you know, and so what's practical and kind of integrative of a global state? And for better or for worse, I chose this 1 to 10 scale, which is similar to the GAF um, you could think of. So, oh, it's supposed to be audio. Let's see if this works. Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> um, I've been doing uh, better than that was the last time I called. Um, uh, I was a lot more depressed the last time I called. Um, um, I just, uh, <clears throat> you know, I have a, a kidney stone and I'm going through menopause and I get migraines. So, um, 
it's just a, an effort of time, um, you know, this particular patient, when she wasn't doing well, she would tend to talk about herself. And even if it was some saying positive things, like I feel like better, but that was when she actually wasn't doing as well. And she would talk about other things when she was doing better, for example. Um, but you could see that, you know, there's a, you start getting a really rich representation of what's going on. But the way we look at it really is looking at the lexical features of the speech sample um, and, you know, do those um, uh, correlate with the global provider ratings. And so this is work that's um, going to be published soon, hopefully. Uh, and, you know, looking at the uh, LIWC is that toolkit I mentioned before, but there are other features. Some of the, the more effective features at correlation are things like the percentage of positive words and negative words that you choose, the difficulty of words. Um, there are also uh, some acoustic features which didn't seem as correlated with uh, their global state as the speech features, but maybe this is because of the kind of features, the way we extracted them, or they were using the telephone calls so that degrades a lot of the quality of the, of the audio, so maybe, maybe in other ways those audio features are, are more informative. And if we look over time, so this is one patient over a course of a year, in black is their provider rating up and down. So you see there's a lot of variability, which is sort of similar to what we saw from other people. There's a lot of you know, inter-rater, in inter-interval variability. And gray is an example of one of the uh, features that was effective for this individual. But if we look at the moving average, it's sort of easier to make sense. You can see black, the, how they're doing over time relative to the mean of their, of their, of their ratings. And then in gray, the uh, one feature, and that was, that was positively correlated, and in light gray, uh, an inversely correlated feature. So um, here there's like a 0.8 correlation between the features and the provider ratings. Um, and so looking using machine learning, support factor machine regression, uh, we tried two different ty type of training models. One is on the population level. Um, so taking everyone else's data and then testing on your samples. So not using your data to learn from. And for that, we got a correlation coefficient with a, the with a global clinical state of, of 0.4 on average for the whole population. Um, but the other approach we could take is an individual um, uh, training method. So using your own data uh, to learn from and testing on data that we weren't, it did not include in the learning uh, algorithm. And we got a much better performance from that and more to come around that. But I think one of the important things here is also the being mindful of the individual. So, you know, people talked about, um, you know, feeling lonely and why did you call? You know, they talked about feeling like no one was listening and that, that calling helped maybe somebody to hear what was going on. And there was this transference connection to their provider through the phone because they knew that we were listening. Uh, and I think that's an important point to think of, you know, when we, when we create these technologies is how can we, how can we include some of that aspects into, the, into these technologies? So lots of next steps. Um, but I wanted to talk about how we kind of come about this and, and taking it forward, this idea of participatory informatics. So in community partnered work, really the focus is around equity and respect and co-creating together. Because who, who creates things matters. Um, so rather than thinking of us as like an individual in isolation, you know, these social determinants and how do those include and then can those inform and then potentially can we influence those determinants. So rather than kind of the usual approach, which is, Experts like, you know, usually people like us in this conference will like kind of create something, uh, but the locus of control, and we, and we might include users, so participatory design or user centered design might include them in some part of that process, but the locus of control really is around the, the technical people and the experts. But can we have a process where we create, we actually create together where the locus of control can be shared? And that was the idea around Chorus, this, this platform where we can co create uh, mobile interventions. So we we, pro, we visually design, not program, uh, interactive apps. So they could be interactive texting apps or even mobile web apps. So these like kind of phones that you might download from the app store, but they're web apps. Um, so you can create data-driven apps in just a few minutes. And we've been having a lot of fun actually exploring how this can be implemented in a couple different ways. So this is us with our community partners uh, co-creating an app for resiliency to be implemented in South Los Angeles. Uh, for the community, and we're actually, I don't know if it comes clear in the picture, but we're actually having fun creating stuff. And we're, you know, creating things together. So it's our, one of our partners who's actually, you know, putting it in the computer. Sometimes we project on the wall, and we just do it in real time. And it really changes sort of the conversation about what it is when you're actually doing it. Um, and then uh, in the partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient programs, we are uh, actually individual patients 
with their therapist are co-creating mobile apps to support their own care and then using it like that day in real time. So we, earlier today, we, t we, we, we um, oh, that's my timer. <laughs> uh, we talked about um, uh, adapting content over time. So this is actual individual patients every week changing the kind of apps that they get. And because of the flexibility, of course, supports a number of projects. Every line is a different, totally different study. Um, uh, so it's been used in a number of ways. And so just to wrap up, to sort of thinking about these approaches together and how do we combine them. And before I finish, I wanted to make one shout out to uh, Saib Khalsa from University of Tulsa who's here and has a great poster I'm collaborating with him on around body mapping and the idea that, you know, when we think about digital diagnosis, there's, there could be novel ways of, of generating kinds of information in here, perceptual maps of like how we perceive our body and emotions and how that can be um, mapped onto the space, onto the body. Uh, so, you know, the mind's eye, if you will, and how that, how that gets mapped on. So he has a poster this afternoon. I'd encourage everybody to, to check it out if you can. Thank you. Thank you.